What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the show. Foreman Jake here. I am pumped because today I got to dive in to a great conversation with one of the smartest people, I think, in the Foreman K industry, Chad Johansson. He's one of the retireholics. He works for Plan Design Consultants. He, man, he knows a lot. And he brings a lot of creative thinking to the industry, and I think that's really hard to find. So when you are working hard to serve your clients and find the most efficient way to reach their goals, and when that focus or that goal is to maximize tax efficiency, there there are some pretty complex things that need to be figured out in the plan. And that's what we dive into today. So I really think this is an episode you're gonna wanna watch, listen, uh, you know, bookmark, you're going to wanna refer back to it because the more that you can steer the conversation for your client towards the right decisions and explain it to them in terms they actually understand, you're gonna be really valuable to them. And that's gonna build brand reputation, which is what we wanna do. So enjoy the the podcast, YouTube, whichever one you're doing today. I really appreciate it. Make sure you subscribe. And uh, let me know what more questions you have. We're gonna keep diving into these topics. So the more that I hear back from you, the more that we can do. Have a great day. Thanks for listening. Let's go. All right, welcome to the show. Super pumped today. We've got Chad Johansson, the one of the most amazingly smart 401k people I've ever met. Can't wait to dive into this topic today because Chad is, if, if you follow the retire holics, he is the one that gets into the weeds, knows the details, and just we've had a lot of conversations lately about plan design. And so kind of to kick things off, I mean, Chad is part of a firm called Plan Design Consultants, or PDC. Um, but then you have the separate brand retireholics, which I think has been yeah. a great, a great thing for the industry. Um, and something that really caught my eye when it first started and I've been a big follower ever since, but today I want to talk because what we find as advisors, I think is unique in the very beginning of a conversation with a new client is trying to understand the goals behind the plan, which if you're not really focused on the goal, I think the plan can go different directions and sometimes not go where you want it to go. So one of the key things that I think in a certain niche, especially professional niches like doctors, attorneys, um, engineers, dentists, they all have this tax strategy as the underlying real push to have the 401k work for them, which is very different from, I think, the general mainstream of participant outcomes and thousands of people working in major enterprise level companies where it's all about scalability of helping people get good advice and retaining good talent. We're not talking about that today. So what I want to dive into with Chad and let, if you want to add anything to your background or any, anything, any fun facts about you, but I want to dive a little bit into this design idea and what we call gateway, which doesn't come out a lot because I think you explain that really well. And I want to, that's going to be part of our topic in the next yeah. club sesh. So I want to talk a little bit of that today. So Chad, tell me, tell us a little bit about kind of what, what brought you to this whole world of 401k and what made you become the nerd you are in the 401k space. And That's we'll the name that. right there. I'm a self-proclaimed nerd. So you describe me as the guy that gets in the weeds. You can just check the nerd box there. My pocket protector's not in, but nonetheless, <laughs> it's all the same. Um, I'll give you the 30, 30 second version of how I got into this business because I do think it's interesting. Uh, my brother is a police officer. He got a hang up 911 call. He went to the house. He heard someone hollering in the background. Little boy answers the door and immediately runs to the back of the house. The brother's fearful that something's happening. So he goes into the house and he finds JD Carlson, the plan design CEO, playing Tiger Woods golf and hollering at the TV, listening to music. And they realize their kids go to the same school. They become friends. Uh, <laughs> years transpire. JD's confiding in my brother saying, hey, we want to continue to grow plan design. We've been around for 30 plus years. We want to take it outside of the family and find someone with skin and bones and brains that we can teach the business the way we do the business as a family. And my brother said, hey, I've got three brothers, two of which you shouldn't talk to, one of which you should. And, uh, and <laughs> wow. I met up with JD and met up with his dad, Paul. My wife and I were living in Southern California at the time. And uh, we really, I, I was incredibly interested in this business. It was another way for me to take the nerdiness that's up here and, and apply it to something I had no clue really existed um, and, and the depths that, that it actually entails. Yeah. And so we moved up to NorCal and it's been almost 11 years now. 
ended up in hanging with JD and the PDC crew and uh, being the nerd, we'll say, for that group. Wow. I didn't know. I didn't know that story. That's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's an interesting story. I mean, it gets a little deeper than that in terms of how JD and my brother became friends. Uh, you can you know JD's personality, and you can think my brother's a chief of police, so you can think they're they might collide a little bit in the way that uh, yeah. that they run shop. Um, but surprisingly, my brother's a Buddhist. He meditates. He's very similar to JD. They both surf, and so they hit it off. And and uh, when JD was confiding in my brother, I'd say that was the biggest door opening for me, because eleven years later, I've got a career a beautiful family a beautiful life and uh i get to hang out with jd and the crew and those guys and have some fun that's awesome yeah i mean that's i think everyone's path to 401k is so unique because nobody really goes to school for that or plans on that and once you get a taste of it i think there's just an element that keeps people there for a long time so well and true truthfully you've talked in, in prior shows and and uh, at times about finding your niche i didn't realize that the 401k was such a big niche. In my yeah. mind, it was financial services, right? That, that that's, the 401k was a small piece of financial services. And because the 401k is such a big component of the average American's future and their retirement capabilities, it's a huge niche. It's a big part of the financial services industry. So as I got into it, I got more and more excited. The more I learned, the more nerdy I got into the tax code and figuring all this stuff out and finding a way, which I think is what we're going to talk about today, finding a way to take, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of tax code, um, content jargon and make it digestible for people. Right. Because I can't sit here and say EBAR and average benefits test and 402 G limits and 415 limits. It's going to go straight over everybody's head and it should, you shouldn't be the nerd. There's good people and systems to run all that work. What we need to do as a community is figure out how do we take that, boil it down into good chunks that the clients can digest and make informed decisions off of. And I think that's what we're going to get into today. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. I think when I started, it was like just drinking from fire hose. I mean, it was so much information and you get caught off guard as an advisor. And I think a big mistake a lot of advisors make is trying to be that know-it-all person when really they know their role. Their role should not be that I have every answer possible. And I know the tax code inside and out. The more you know, it's better, it's helpful, Yeah. but you have to have the right partners. And the key partner you have to first have is a TPA. I mean, that's, you don't start anywhere else, but have a good TPA that really knows what industry you're focused on and can help guide you. And as you go through every single meeting, you're gonna learn something new. Like I literally learn something new every day, I feel like. And it's been five straight years of only 401ks. So for someone that doesn't even focus on it and dabbles and has under 10 plans, uh, the the amount of value that a TPA can bring them is tremendous, especially when you get these professional businesses that are all they're trying to do is tax strategy. And you've got really complex organizational structures and then you bring the accountant in and that's where you have to have enough know, know about what to do to steer the, the conversation sometimes in the right direction. I have one of those yeah. coming up here in like 45 minutes to talk about the structure to help maximize this benefit for this doctor. So that's what I want to talk about. Like how we, we all know safe Harbor. We know that 3% non-elective is really the starting point, but then going from there, how to get someone to that next level of maxing out the plan to 57,000 is a very tricky conversation to have. And you, you have to know the right questions to ask and how to explain it. So they get it because they're not going to know the technical terms that you're, you're talking about. You have your own language. Yeah. So tell us a little about that. Tell us how you kind of approach that situation, how, how we can as advisors do a better job at teeing those up and, and, and so the client can make a quicker decision to move forward. Yeah. I'll take one step back to take two forward. Um, you talk about designing the plan for tax efficiency purposes. I'll, I'll often say in a meeting and, and I'll make up the statistic because obviously this isn't tracked, but about 80% of plan design is dictated by the objectives of the owner and the other 20% is dictated by the census. Yeah. And what I mean by that is an owner can say, I want to save 57,000 or I want to save 10,000 a year, or I want to save 200,000 a year. And that's really going to dictate what type of plan we set up. Now, if you tell me you want to save 57,000, we have some different options, but now we need to look at the demographics of your firm to determine if those options actually work. Right. And that's kind of what you're getting into is, is anybody can step into a meeting and say, well, if you put in a safe Harbor, you can save your 19,500. 
For the most part, very simple and true. But getting from 19.5, or let's say you got the safe harbor in there. So let's say it's roughly 25, 27,000 because you're getting the 3% as well as an owner to the 57,000 is where we start to bring in non-elective contributions. Most people know yep. profit sharing is the term. Um, and how to explain that profit sharing is, is crucial. So I often ask a client in the beginning of a meeting in order for, for me to better understand their objectives, if you could look back at the prior year. So if we could look back at 2019, business was great. I put a safe in the middle of the table. I opened it up and I said, all right, Mr. And Mrs. Business Owner, you can take as much money out of your 2019 income. You can put it in that safe. And Jake's going to help you invest it. But we're going to close that safe and we're going to let that grow. We're going to have it be there for you in retirement. If you look back at 2019, how much money do you want to put in that safe? Is it 10 grand? Is it 30 grand? Is it 50? Is it 200? And I try to get them to give me a number, even though that's tough for them. I try to get them to give me a number so that I know how to steer the design consultation. So you a number without even like saying, here's the different levels. Yeah, You're saying, no need to get in design. your budget, what can you do? Yeah. And, and often they don't understand that if they say 50,000, it's not actually 50,000 out of their take home pay. So we're talking about tax deferred savings. Yeah. Um, I kind of leave that to the side. I just want to know what the budget is. I've stepped into meetings where an advisor is telling me, Hey, they're really motivated to set up a plan. They want to save a bunch of money. And I'm in there talking with them and they tell me they want to save about five grand a year. And I say, okay, that's a very different conversation now. But once we know a roundabout of what that number is, we can really determine how deep we need to get into a step. So if they tell me 30 grand is their goal and they can't go above that, I don't need to get into profit sharing. I need to tell them that it can be there as a discretionary feature and that you can get 57,000 when, when the time is right and the business continues to thrive. But I don't need to talk to them about cross testing at this point. That's, that's minutia in their mind, right? It's just turning the wheels and it's not helping them make an informed decision because they've already told us they don't need it. Yeah. So, so I, I take point. two steps back to take two forward. So I start with that safe conversation. How much do you want to put in? And let's assume they say somewhere in the range of 50 grand. So we're looking at a 401k profit sharing type plan. I call those steps one, two, and three. We're looking at steps one, two, and three on this staircase of funding. Yeah. And I'm going to say that a 401k tends to be the first step and is the most effective way for a business owner to get to 50k. Okay. So I start with the 401k, say you defer your 19,500. That's a personal deferral out of your own income. Now this step is highly tested. So we need a safe harbor to allow you to save the 19,500. The safe harbor, the one you mentioned earlier is what we call a non-elective. Um, that means everybody who's eligible is going to get the 3%. And I'm, I'm summarizing a little bit because obviously you can can exclude highly compensated employees from the safe harbor, and that might cause top heavy implications. I'm gonna leave all that aside. This is a clean opportunity, right? The, the sample yeah. we have is a clean opportunity. So we've got the 401k for the 195. We're using the safe harbor 3% at this point in the conversation in order to get us to the next step, which is getting this owner to that 50,000 mark. Right now, the limit is 57,000 for someone who's under age 50. So 57,000 is our delta, that's our goal, that's what we're trying to get to. Right. So the conversation I typically have from there is that if your 401k, how much you personally save is optional each year, the 3% is not optional. You're locking yourself in to giving 3% to the staff in order to allow you to save the 19.5 in step number one. Now to go above that and get to the 57,000, we're going to use a feature called profit sharing. It has nothing to do with profits. It is simply a way for you as an organization to say, I want to take more money and in a tax efficient manner, shelter it for my retirement. And in doing so, I'm likely going to have to reward my employees. And at this point, when I'm having this conversation, I have to say, look, you're going to have to give it to somebody. It's either going to be the IRS or it's going to be your staff. Now, my obligation to you as your consultant is to say, can we save more in taxes than what we're giving to our staff? Right. So for example, if we're in a 40% tax bracket and I take a dollar and pay and I give 40 cents to the IRS, well, what if I put that dollar in my retirement now I only have to give 10 cents to my employees? Now we're saving more in taxes than what we're giving to our staff. I call that a tax positive plan. That's always what I'm aiming for. It's green numbers in any of my illustrations. I'm aiming for green numbers. So that means we're saving more than what we're giving. Right. Yeah. And I, that's a similar approach I've taken with, it's calling that ratio, you know, 
making sure that it's going to be a bigger savings for you tax wise now. And sometimes I get pushback from a client saying, well, I'm going to have to pay tax on it later. And so then I have to go on this whole tax bracket strategy discussion with them of when they're going to spend it, which is totally separate from the plan. So I think as advisors help them understand, you know, it's what happens in the future happens in the future right now, you, that's going to the IRS or it's going to your staff. And if that number is not a positive number, that's where you have to have a conversation to say, is this a cultural decision for your company yes. to give them this? And maybe that's where you talk about a match instead. So when I come across the professional physician plan that has a match, I immediately wonder how that ended up being in place, right? Because that's really not the most efficient way for most practices to get the most tax savings for the physicians at the lowest cost. Sometimes the ratios and the number of staff, you know, would make that go that way, but I'm but, constantly finding that scenario. Yeah. And the match thought your, your general premise there is accurate, but if they had told us our goal was 30 K then the match is more than likely the most yeah. way to get there. And, and just to, just to elaborate on that is, the match is exactly as it sounds. You're matching what an employee puts into the plan. You can get the same safe harbor protections. Typically, you're going to go up to a 4% match. But if you have low participation, then often your 4% match costs you less than the 3% that you would give to everybody who's eligible. Right, right. So at times, it can make sense. And that's why that look first at the total question, number, right? You're saying, yeah. so you could do like a 6%, 6% enhanced safe harbor and the math of that 6% based on the 285 income for that owner could get you to that dollar amount that they're trying to put away. Right. And that scenario could be cheaper because you're not going to get everybody doing full 6% most likely. Yep. And that's, yeah. that's where the other 20% of the census dictates the design really comes into play, right? If I look at that plan and I say, you have all people who are making $106,000, they're likely to participate in the match and get 4%. So in that scenario, I might say, look, don't go the match route. Let's do the 3% non-elective because we know those people are going to save. They're making enough money to save. On the other hand, if your, your staff is all folks that are 30 years old and making 40 grand a year, they're less likely to save right. because it's yeah. tougher for them financially. Yeah. So in that scenario, you look at the match and you say, well, out of your 10 employees, only two are likely to participate. So the match is the most effective way, not only for you to save, remember, talking about a tax efficient plan, that's the objective here, but it's also a motivator for the staff so it can accomplish other things as well. Let's, I want to throw a curveball at this. So let's say they, they want to just max out the plan, 57,000, and they want to do that all, not in, none of the 19.5, nothing through payroll. Yeah. How do they get to that point from what they have to give their staff? So like, let's, what, what would be your steps there? Let's walk through the profit sharing feature because that's going to answer your question and still add on to what we were just talking about with the step. So, so if I'm looking to get to that 57,000, whether I use steps one and two or not, meaning the 401k and the safe harbor, mm -hmm. I'm going to have to use profit share. There's no, no way around yeah. that in order to get right. 57,000. Yeah. So there are multiple types of profit sharing. There's pro rata, meaning everybody gets the same percentage. There's age weighted, which means people who are older tend to get a higher percentage than people who are younger. And I'm going to explain that in greater detail in a moment. There's integrated, which means we use social security benefits to say those who are not getting social security on all of their comp can actually get a little higher percentage in profit sharing than those who are getting social security benefits on all of their compensation. And then there's the most common which, it, which is called new comparability or cross-testing. It's got two different names. It's not new anymore. It's been around forever. Um, yeah, no. I will tell old, you, new old comparability. You, you mentioned earlier when you see a plan that has a match, you kind of wonder why. If I see a plan that doesn't have new comparability, I immediately wonder why. What was the intellect? What was the reason behind that? Here's, here's the truth. In a new comparability plan, I'm going to call it cross-testing. So that's what most know it by. I can give everybody the same percentage. Boom. Therefore, I can just accomplish pro rata. My objective is to give everybody the same percentage. I can do so in new comparability. In new comparability, I can use the age of the owners who tend to be closer to retirement than the average age of the staff. So I can use the age benefit to give the owners a higher dollar amount than what I have to give to the staff. So now I've accomplished age weighted. So I've got the best of pro rata. I've got the best of age weighted. 
I can't use Social Security in this calculation, but 99 out of 100 times, new comparability works better than an integrated strategy. So very rarely will I ever write a plan with integrated. So the point of that, that conversation right there, Jake, is to say, I almost always write new comparability into every single plan, every single plan. Hmm, Number one, okay. it's discretionary. Number two, it can accomplish pro rata. It can work almost the same as age weighted. Integrated usually doesn't make greater sense than using cross testing or new comparability. And what's, do you know, you probably know this, the code on the 5,500 that says their new comp is in the plan? It doesn't say their new comp. It says that they're either age weighted or new comp, and it's 2A on the 50. 2A, that's right. Okay. Code. Yeah. So that's an easy way to identify a plan. Look at that and knowing those, those codes to look out for, because even if it's not audited, you can at least tell that. Yeah. And that give you a talking point. And I think it's important not to go in and like attack or make someone feel like, how come you didn't do this right? But show them as more of an opportunity that you could do something a little better with your plan and I have some ideas for you. Yeah, that's a, it's a good point. JD taught me early in this business is when you sit in that room, it is very likely that someone in that room made these decisions. And they may have made these decisions without knowing uh, best. Maybe they didn't have a consultant that laid out proper foundation for them. Nonetheless, someone made those decisions. So don't sling mud, be objective, yeah. give them the pros and cons, and make sure you're letting them know what the positives are of making this kind of change. Yep. So, so, so let me finish this out for you. Okay. Um, if I've got to take you from, let's just say 30,000 to 57,000, then I'm only needing to put into profit sharing $27,000 for that business owner right? Because I'm taking you from 30 to 57. Right. So 27,000 is, is a certain percentage of that owner's compensation. Right. Okay. Let's just say that owner's making a hundred grand and make it simple. It's 27% I'm giving them now. Right. But if I had to do the full 57,000 in profit sharing and they're making a hundred thousand dollars a year, now I have to give them 57% of compensation, right? In order to get them up to the 57,000. Now the percent that I give the owner often has implications on the percent that I have to give the staff. So if I'm giving the owner 57,000, let's just say for sake, I might have to give the staff 10%, 12%. But if I'm only giving the owner uh, 27,000, I might only have to give the staff 5%. Now. So, so sometimes profit sharing only to get to the 57 can actually work. And I think that's what we're gonna get into next, which is gateway. Yes. Sometimes it can work. But other times, the most effective way to get the owner to the 57,000 is to use steps one and step two, and then step on step three being the discretionary profit sharing to get them there. Because the percentage of pay that we have to give them in profit sharing comes down so much when they've already deferred their 19.5. Right, but you're not saying pro rata, so 27%, you're saying age weighted or cross tested is a better route to go because you're not, you don't wanna give someone 27%, that's a, that's a crazy high number. So it's going to come down because you look at the averages between the two okay. groups. Yeah. So my example is if I'm given 27%, I might have to give 12% to the staff. And how can that vary? Cause it's not pro rata, right? 27 mm. for my owner, 12 for my staff. Yeah. What I'm doing there is I'm using cross testing to say this blanket statement here, cross testing leverages the time and value of money. Okay. Time and value of money says if I give an owner who's 50 years old, a dollar, and I give an employee who's 20 years old a dollar, whose dollar is more valuable? Time and value of money tells us that that young employee's dollar is more valuable. So it has more time yeah. to grow, right? Yeah. So that's why I can do 27 and 12, because I'm saying our owner is closer to retirement, has less time for that money to grow. So I don't have to give the staff as much as I'm giving the owner. And when I look at that as a benefit in retirement, those are sufficient. The IRS says you're giving enough to the staff to justify the 27% you're giving to your owner. So how do you, how do you come to that conclusion? Like you don't get in like exact detail, but kind of high level. How, do, when someone brings you that scenario, how do you determine what that ratio, what that number will be? So I'm going to, I'm going to answer this in three different ways. Really. The first is that it, it needs, you need to have a variance in age and income between the staff and the ownership. Okay. That variance should be about 15 years, works best. So the average age of your owners versus the average age of your staff. If there's a 15-year gap, it's going to work really well. 
Okay, so Got that's it. the okay. first thing. The okay. second thing is income variance. Your owner needs to make enough money. If you're trying to get 57,000 away and they're taking 50 grand in W2 and the rest are taking in a draw as an escort, I can't get you 57,000 in profit sharing if you're only paying yourself 50,000 in W2. It won't work. So the owner has to have enough eligible income. In an S corp, that's W2. In a C corp, that's W2. Um, in a sole proprietorship, it's Schedule C. So there's, there's different variances in terms of what income we count. Yeah. But Which the owner's income needs to be greater than the, than the employee's income. Got it. So okay. that's going to significantly help create that gap. And now to get to the question that you and I originally chatted about, which is going to be on this session next, your case session, um, is the gateway. So gateway is tough for folks to understand. And just for those that haven't really heard that term, in, in the profit sharing world, the gateway, if I give it literally, means you're going to give a certain percentage, a minimum to the staff that opens up the gates that should allow a business owner to max out to 57000 I say should, and I'm going to get to that now. So the gateway is typically written as you have to give one third of the highest percentage that you're giving to a highly compensated employee. So to stop there, if we're giving a 6% of pay contribution to an owner, then one third of that would be 2%. If I gave the staff 2%, my gate's open. If I was giving an owner 9%, then a third of that would be three. So if yeah. I give the staff 3%, my gate's open. 12%, then again, gates are gonna open, right? Um, at 4%, that is. So one yeah. third is the number that I have to give the staff in order to max out the partners. The other yeah. gateway says a max of 5%. It says once I reach 5%, boom, gates blow open. We can now go into the stadium. We should be able to max out the owners. I say should because we need 15 years of age variance, roughly, and a, and a compensation gap, right? If we don't have that age variance and compensation gap, then 5% might not be enough. Even though the gates are open, there's now a, forget their names, the person that stands at the end of the aisle, the arena when you walk in, they're like, let me see your tickets. Please. The ushers? The ushers, there you go. <laughs> now you gotta pass the usher, right? And the usher yeah. is the compliance test. So okay. you, gave, you gave 5%, so you should be able to max out. But now we get into the compliance testing to make sure that we're not discriminating against those staff, because 5% is not always enough. And if the age and income variance isn't great enough, the compliance testing might come back and say, hey, you actually have to give 7% in order to max out your owner. I know 5% was your gateway, you're in, but the usher is telling you, sorry, you've got to give 2% more. And how do we come to that in a, in a 30,000 foot level? We're doing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip some of the testing. I'm going to say most of the time we're doing what's called an average benefits test. We're taking what we're giving to everybody we're projecting it as a benefit in retirement. We're looking at what that benefit in retirement is as a percentage of their current day compensation. And we're saying, is the benefit in retirement sufficient enough in comparison to the benefit that we're promising the employees in retirement? And if that benefit is not, if it's not sufficient enough, if we're not giving enough to the staff for that to be a comparable benefit in retirement, then we have to give more to the staff. But how do you, how do you Calculate that. Is there like a return on the investment that you generally use to come to that number? Yeah, most of is it is actuarial, actuarial tables. Most of it is actuarial tables. So we look at the age has implication um, and APR has implication. And we take the dollar amount that we're giving. We run it through, um, it's called normalizing the benefit. You run it through a, a calculation based on the actuarial tables to determine what that would become in retirement. So how much time they have to let that grow, what the projected interest rate might be. Then you take that number and, and you create an EBAR score. You divide it by their compensation. And you look at that and say, are these averages enough to say we're not discriminating? Right. So, so here's, okay, go ahead. I was going to say, so, so if you think about this logically, um, if there's not a big age gap and I'm giving my owner 27000 in that example, uh, and I'm giving my, my staff, so let's say it's 27% of pay, and I'm, giving, I'm trying to give my staff 5%. When I run that out, it's going to come back and say, hey, the benefit for the owner, excuse me, because they're similar in age, 
the benefit for the owner is drastically higher than the benefit for the employee because they have about the same amount of time to grow. So you can't do 27% and 5%. You got to do 27% and 20%. Yeah. Now, if the owner's older and it has more time to grow, then those numbers make way more sense. So again, 80% is dictated by what they want to accomplish. 20% is going to be controlled by that census. Right. Okay. So kind of in summary, knowing the range of, you know, if you do 3%, not elective safe harbor and the gateway, potentially the max can be about 5%, maybe, I mean, but it's just a kind of a rough guideline to say, yeah, give everyone about 8%. And maybe you don't even want to go to that path of throwing out numbers. It's probably safer not to, but in your head, you've got to kind of have some, something that well, you're formulating. You're right. And if, if you don't have the census details, then what you just started to do is great. I asked the question early in the meeting, what's the average age of your employees? Depending mm -hmm. on who's in the room yeah. with me of the ownership, I'll ask, what's your age? If I feel like they're comfortable with me asking that, I'm going to ask it. And I'm going to try yeah. to see, do I have 15 years of gap? And once I know if I have 15 years of gap, if their budget says that they want to get 57,000, now I can tell them it's likely going to be 5% to the pay to, of staff. Yeah. And okay. then I'll usually ask, what's the annual compensation for your payroll? Um, and they come back and say, it's a million dollars. I say, okay, of that million, how much of that has been here for over a year? Oh, only about 750,000. Okay. So our 5% is of 750K. So now does getting you 57,000 justify 5% of 750K? And remember that the 5% we're giving to the staff is also a tax deduction. Right. So typically when I run this out, I say, what, what tax deduction are we getting for the owner by sheltering this money? Yeah, what personally and the business. Yeah, I think we forget business. that all the time. Yeah. And then yeah, I do the same thing point. with the staff, right? If we're giving them 50 grand, well, if we're in a 50% tax bracket to make numbers easy in my mind, then we've saved 25 grand in taxes. Because if we didn't give them 50, it's going to flow through the business and be taxed to our owner, who's at a 50% yeah. tax bracket. So yeah. now I use that 25 grand we've just saved in taxes. And I say, okay, we still have a 50 grand cost to staff. But if you save 25 grand and the employee contribution saved you 25 grand in taxes, then we've saved 50K, even though you gave 50K. That would be a tax neutral plan, right? Saved as much in taxes as we gave. The goal is to find tax positive where you save 50 grand in taxes and you only give six grand to the staff. That's when things look real sexy. And that often works in those professional practices. That's why this kind of setup works so well in a professional practice. Um, yeah. The other thing I'll mention, Jake, is you talk about phone out numbers. I will say 5% often. And I'll tell them that's a perfect world, right? 5% means the numbers align but we could have to go higher than that. And I will tell you the biggest error I find in businesses, closely held businesses that do this, is I tell them 5%, the age and the income variance work well, and then they put their spouse on payroll. And that spouse makes 25 grand and they defer 19.5 of it. Now when I get to running average benefits testing and I'm saying that spouse just got a huge percentage of pay as a deferral, that, that gets taken into consideration and can blow up the average benefits test. So I told you 5%, that works clean, but now that you put 19.5 into your spouse, it's 8% that we have to give the staff mm, okay. in order to get you up there. I so that's have a that exact error. scenario coming up in this next meeting. So that's really helpful, actually. Let me, let me tell you, the way I handle that, Jake, is I say, if they tell me their goal is 50K and I know that a spouse is working in the business, I said, well, look, if you defer 19.5 and, and he defers 19.5 and you each get a match, now I've got the household to 50K and your only right. obligation is the match. Right. So there's some creative ways to get them to that number without having to give large percentages. No, it's totally true. Yeah, that's the thing. There's not one, there's not one answer. And that's, I think, where I think it's the TPA, the administrative world is so unique in that what you do is pretty Black, I mean, there's systematic ways that you're going to go about calculating these numbers, right? But there is so much more to it that it's almost like, will it ever be automated to, this, to the point where I can drop a census into a system and spit this out without paying a TPA to do it? I, I don't know. Like, uh, there are a the lot that do it that way. There, I call them volume shops. TPAs and a lot of bundled providers, they don't have someone that understands, well, 
he's an S corp. So if we bumped his pay a little bit, it would create this kind of implication on the testing. It, we, we, you call it data in, data out, right? There are many companies that do that. You give them a census, they throw it in the system, and they spit back out results. That's, I think that's what brings value but, to a good TPA. But they're not, the thing is, even with those shops, they're not necessarily that much cheaper. That's no. what I found. I mean, it's like a few hundred bucks, but for the difference in service and actual creative thinking and backing up what you're trying to do is so, so much bigger than the dollar amount difference. So yeah. the key to that is like, really, you get what you pay for, but it's really not that much more to get a high quality experience because as that business changes, as you know, especially in the doctor world, like partners are changing constantly. Mm -hmm. People are buying in every year, getting out, retiring. It is constant movement. And what happens this year may be totally different next year. And if your TPA is not on top of things and they're not including you as the advisor, that's the thing. That's my pet peeve is when TPAs don't include me, even though it's a conversation they need to have with the, the group, I want to know about it. Yeah. And, and I have TPAs that have unfortunately not included me on in things. And I find out later drives me crazy. Not that I am going to make a difference to that scenario, but I need to know because I'm, I want to be the hub of that client. I want to be the closest to that client. Well, so, and, and you are our advocate and we are your advocate. Like yeah. we may not be sitting in person with that client. You might be. We, we need you to be able to communicate some of these topics and reinforce what we're telling them. And then to yeah. go back to your last point, Austin, ounce prevention is worth a pound of cure. You might save $300 by going to a low cost TPA or bundled solution. But if you're spending an extra five grand in your profit sharing calcs because they didn't properly create the allocation groups, or even worst case scenario, you, you don't get the proper consultation and somewhere down the road, you bump in profit sharing and your spouse is in there and it blows up and it costs you a whole bunch more. You get in trouble because you didn't properly cover the right employees when you didn't know what your, how your doc was written. I mean, all of those things can lead yeah. to huge out of pockets for a small business that if you just have the right team, then you're going you're gonna to hopefully mitigate any of those chances. Yeah, totally. And that's where you need to have enough confidence as an advisor to say, this is who we use. And there is really back up the partners that they're introducing and not just go straight to cheapest price. I mean, that happens so often. It's like, well, this is the lowest cost. And too many clients will like, they'll gravitate, go right to that because cost is a big deal right now. Everyone's freaking yeah. out. Like they don't have enough cash to make it a month without income. Like they're, they're living check to check as a business. And so when they see a 401k and it's $500 cheaper or even sometimes a lot more, um, I, it sometimes can lead to a bigger nightmare and a huge, huge expense they didn't even know they were doing. Yeah. And, and I'll leave you kind of with, with two parting thoughts on that. First, early in this business, JD's dad told me this. And I thought it was really interesting to, to kind of think about it. Um, and it holds true to this day, which is that from an advisor perspective, when I'm talking to you, Jay, um, your client doesn't know that there's a $500 cheaper TPA out there. They right. don't. They don't. So if you roll in with me and I cost $2,500 a year and another TPA costs two grand a year, your client doesn't know that. And if you feel as the advisor that I'm the greater value, that, that a high-end TPA is a greater value, then it's your obligation, your responsibility not to show them that $2,000 TPA because yeah. that's not what's right for them. There's always a cheaper advisor out there. There's always a cheaper record keeper. You can yeah. always find a TPA that's going to charge you 350 bucks a year, but that's usually not right for the client. So totally. I, I think, I think as a, I, and what Paul told me is you're from an advisory perspective, you're not going to lose the business by not showing the cheapest. Right. Right. Because your client doesn't know that there's cheaper out there. Yeah. Even, but even if you did and you didn't win it, your reputation to work with the best and someone that is supporting you is going in the long run pay off way bigger. Mm -hmm. And that leads to like the whole conversation we're going to have on Thursday is building your brand is, is so much bigger than just your logo. Like <laughs> there's so much more to it. And if you don't like the world, you know, personal brand, it's reputation. And so having the right partners in place. And I think a huge value that advisor brings is they're constantly reviewing the partners they have and having open conversations when something goes wrong, not just firing that TPA and then moving on to the next one, like talking through that and determining 
can we continue to work with you, you know, given what happened and just, you know, having the ability to do due diligence ongoing is a big value you have to bring. And yeah. it takes time and it feels like you're wasting time doing it, but it is, it's so important for the client. So, yeah. all right. Hey, let me, let me give one nugget. Yeah. Wrap it up. One nugget um, for advisors from a prospecting perspective with profit sharing and new comparability. If you step into a plan that has a 3% non-elective and they're not funding profit sharing, which can be kind of common, right? Especially right now with what's going on in the economy, there's businesses that had anticipated funding it, but they're not, but they still have the 3% in. Remember how I told you the, the gateway works in multiples of three, essentially it's a third. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, if you're giving a 3% non-elective, aren't you already giving 3% in that gateway? So often, if the owners are getting 3% as well, you can give them 6% profit sharing and not have to give a single cent more to the staff because it works in multiples of three. You've already given three, so we can do nine for the ownership. Well, we've given them three in the safe harbor, so let's do another six in profit sharing for the ownership and not have to give anything else to the staff. Right, because the 3% is included in the gateway right. number. Right, because it's going to everybody. It's non elective it's a great way business. I step in, it doesn't happen all that often, but you step into a plan that has it and you're like, yeah, we just haven't been funding profit sharing. The employees are used to getting 3%. So we didn't change to the match. We wanted to leave it this way. And when you tell them they can do an extra six without increasing the cost, like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I love that. That's big. Yeah. No, that, that comes up a lot. And it's like, why are you doing a match when you like, and you're doing a match and a profit sharing. It's like, you could be, <laughs> doing both the employees that come out ahead. We just switched the plan from this at the very end of last year. Same exact scenario. They were doing a match. We switched over to 3% added the profit sharing and cost was the same or a little bit less, but the employees were getting more like uh, barely, but like everybody won in that scenario. Yeah. So, um, but it was a, it was a communication discussion. Then it was like, how are we going to communicate to the staff? So they don't feel like they're losing because now it just says 3% and discretionary. You got to kind of be careful how you explain that and how you present it. And, and so you don't get anybody feeling like they're getting a that's benefit taken form. away. So that's a critical role the advisor needs to play in that because most, the TBA is not going to get involved and explain that well, they're going to explain it in terms they know. And so that's got to be your role. Yeah. You know, you're, you and your staff and you can't outsource that. I can't, I don't ever outsource to enroll me. So I'm unique in that way. I don't, I do them all myself, me or my director of operations, and we were tag team those, but communication of the match and the formula and how it's all happening is so important. It's crucial. So, yeah. I love that. That's a good point. And, that, and that's been really useful because I've found plans and won them because of that, that simple conversation. Knowing enough to, be, even though I have to have the TPA really run the numbers, I know enough to say, you know, we can actually get you a better situation here. And everyone's going to win. Yeah. So, all right, Chad, I got to run to this next meeting. I appreciate your time. I, uh, I, well. I learned everything. I want to, the next one, I want to dive into cash balance at some point with you because that ties in right with this, right? Like yeah. you can't really get to that next level of cash balance without figuring this all out first. And that's a really, that even adds a layer of complexity with an actuary. So it's um, step four. We talked yeah. one, two, and three. It's step four. And, and the same premise exists. It's time and value of money is usually what we're leveraging there. Totally. Yeah. So that I think is a really interesting, hard topic to learn for a lot of advisors. And uh, when they, even when they screw that communication up, that leads to some really confused partners of a firm, not knowing what the cash balance is and how it works. Yeah. I mean, that is, I run into that all the time. Explain mm -hmm. to them what this actually is doing for them and how it's different from the 401k. Cause they don't think like that. They think they're putting this money in. It's theirs. Like how did the market was up 30% last year? How come it only shows 4%? Yeah. Oh, uh, we'll dive into that next time. Okay. I like it. All right. Thanks again, Chad. Thanks. Jay. You take it. care, you buddy. Are we'll amazing. Talk to you on Thursday. Yep. Excited for it. Me too. Right. Okay. We'll talk to you later. See you, man. See you.